ready to go. You jump in front of your computer and nothing. A big blank. You start scratching your head. Like you're motivated. You want to do this and nothing. It's like you can't find the words. You can't figure out what to do. And slowly but surely, you start getting mad at yourself. You start beating yourself up. What? Why am I not getting anything done? Uh, I've got a timer. I've got, I'm ready to go. Listen, if you've ever had this, you might be suffering from a common plague that afflicts so many students, professors, and people at almost at any stage of their career. And it's low P or low productivity. We're going to dig in today. We're going to take a data-driven scientific approach to understand what are some reasons that you might have suffered from low P. And if you feel like you're productive, but maybe you could be more productive, you're going to walk away with some practical tips that are going to help you optimize your productivity in everything we do, every walk of life. We want to be as efficient as possible to get to where we're trying to go. So for many of you, this is going to help you if you've been struggling or feeling stuck. For others of you, this is going to help you reach efficiency gains that you may not have even known were possible. Also, as we go through this mini training, we're going to then turn to your questions, of course, and the submissions this week that we got from our Facebook group. If you haven't already joined our Facebook group, I know several of you are joining from different platforms, do join it. It's a great place for us to connect. I specifically created the group Fast Track because I wanted to help democratize higher education. I was increasingly frustrated that I felt many of the things that I learned were one-to-one -one from mentors and just not available to many people across the world. I've come more and more to learn that the challenge for many students is not that they can't do research powerfully. It's not that they're not smart enough or not capable. It's just that they're not getting the right training, support, and guidance. Training and support that you often can't find just from a textbook these days. It comes really through bespoke, customized training to meet your needs. Um, so with that, I'm gonna dive into our productivity clinic. Again, one thing I have learned, never really intended to get into YouTube or Facebook or any of this, I never had a pre profile before I started uh, this platform, um, is that if you do give us a like, if you enjoy our content, the algorithm then searches other people just like you to try to reach out to them and let them know that this support is available, valuable, and free to them. So do give us a like. It, it lets others know that you're getting value and it really helps us to serve others who might not otherwise have benefited. Um, so hey, Katija, hey, Tal, really great to have, have you join. Uh, both of you I know are extremely productive. Uh, and uh, Tal, uh, some of you may know Tal, we just uh, put out a video of a great chat conversation with Tal and I, where Tal expressed some of his experiences going from being completely down and, and blue to now high-flying, well on the road to academic success. An amazing story. Uh, great to have you join us. And the other thing that's great in the group is you can reach people like Tal and others who we have the philosophy that if you've benefited from the support and training, you too have a responsibility to pass it on. So Tal, I'm kind of speaking for you. Um, if you disagree, let me know in the chat, but uh, that you're also really happy to provide that mentorship. And we have that in our group through group chats where we have other professors like me, um, grad students, and just dedicated people who want to make the world a better place join the conversation. Okay, so turning to productivity. Um, one of the things that really separates the journey during a PhD is that it's not just like working a job where you have a task given to you that you have to accomplish. It's not like where you have a class, where you have a syllabus, and you might have to try to get a good grade to get to the next step. With a PhD, you have to master your own mind. And in doing that, you have to confront, in some cases, some of your own inner demons. You hear a lot of people talk about their PhD as well as like their baby that they were trying to birth. Um, something very intimate, passionate, very personal to them. And when you hear people talk about their PhD, you realize that they have had an internal struggle to get to the to the finish line. Now, for some people, they're very self-motivated. They have a high level of intrinsic motivation. This comes naturally. But what's often different in a PhD is this is for the first time where you might not have a clear roadmap. You might know, you know which, which road to take to get to, to the next step. 
And often in scenarios and times like these of uncertainty, the worst enemy holding you back is you. Stay with me. So, uh, like I said before, if if that's you in front of the computer having a blank and then beating yourself up. Or if that's you uh, not reaching out for help when you need it. Or if that's you failing to take into account some of the tips I'm going to share with you to get that right support that can, these tweaks that can fix your productivity or at least diagnose what is the root cause of the problem. Um, You're holding yourself back unnecessarily. And so to to conquer these demons, to, to go beyond maybe what you haven't done before is a challenge because often our minds will resist. We will often tell ourselves anything, any story to keep from putting ourselves and exposing ourselves to something challenging. Um, I, I, some of you may have experienced this in a different domain, going to the gym. All right. For many people, there, there's a lot of mental discipline to first force yourself to get into a gym to train. And then once you're there, to even push yourself to get the benefits that that gym has to offer. And that means pushing yourself beyond what may be comfortable. And this is definitely the case when doing a PhD because you are being stretched. It is the only degree that that effectively, I believe, I argue, you can't really buy. And I love working with people who have PhDs because I know they have developed a mental resolve, a mental wherewithal. They have been able to conquer inner demons that hold them back from doing things that are hard. Because you have to force yourself to step into an environment, a situation where you may draw those blanks, where you may feel uncomfortable, where you may feel uncertain. And our normal impulse when faced with that is to run, is to go the other way. And how does that symptom play out? Falling behind, feeling frustrated, losing hope, and eventually uh, facing a vicious cycle of burnout. And the reality is that most people who, who start on a PhD, on average, the statistics are one out of three do not finish. And it's very easy for us to then, our mind, again, protecting ourselves, find anybody else. No, it's, it's my supervisor. Oh, no, I didn't get the right training. Or find any reason. No. You have to master your own mind. And ultimately, the responsibility for the success or failure is with you. It's a very hard thing to accept. It's a, I know it's a very, very hard thing to accept. But what about, what about, what about? No. And rem- you need to bear in mind that this is part of the challenge and the struggle of getting to the end, of getting to that next level. Now, uh, you say, yeah, but I- I'm struck. I'm struggling. I don't know what to do. We're going to go through that. So what we're going to do is we are going to approach your productivity like scientists. We are going to try to get the data we need to understand what is a source of low P and how you can fix it. Um, Because there are tried, established, tested solutions to productivity. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not here to sell you anything. I just want to help you get to where you want to go. And I don't want you to feel trapped and that you have to run away from this. So I'm going to pull up the whiteboard. I'm going to give you a very simple framework that's going to identify and diagnose some of, some of the most common causes of low P and tactics to help you deal with it. So, okay, I've got here a whiteboard and hope you all can see it. If you can't see it, let me know. That uh, Unfortunately, sometimes it does happen to me that uh, things on my screen um, don't show up how, how I hope they're going to. And let's see here. Uh, does this have the whiteboard? I'm not sure. This is, hang on two seconds, guys. This does not appear to be showing the whiteboard. So hang on a second. Let me try this again. I'm just going to connect uh, the, the whiteboard on the screen. So let me move the source. Let's add a source. Okay. All right. Now, now we should be able to see it. Okay. So let me give you a simple framework. And I, I do this because as a scientist, I like to use DAGs, which if you've seen some of our quant training, which you can find freely in our group, if you're doing quant research, 
actually any research, a DAG is helpful to set out your logic. So if we're looking at, we're going to trace the underlying causes of low P. Um, there, there are really two domains going on. I'm going to just kind of draw this imaginary line, just put them. One domain, I'm going to uh, say, is, is a set of technical problems that you're confronting. And the other domain uh, are, are really a, a set of mental problems. I'm not saying you have mental health problems or issues, although um, this can happen, especially if you've gone through burnout. People can get tipped into a short-term depression and get bad where they start withdrawing from their friends, their family, and, and not seeking out the support exactly at the time that they need it the most. Um, so I'm going to go through a few of these. And, and right, you may recognize some of these feelings, and these feelings are in a gradient. It's a feeling of, yeah, that's me, 10 out of 10. That, that describes me. Maybe, uh, no, not so much. One or, one or two or not at all. All right, so, okay, one of these. So one of the, one of the technical problems that, that people have is don't know what to do. I get, we see this a lot in the group. People who are in our quantitative chat say, I don't know how to do a multivariate regression. I'm stuck, and I just technically don't know using SPSS or Stata or R how to clean the data or do this step, and I'm banging my head against the wall. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm watching millions of YouTube videos. I don't know what to do. That's a technical problem your productivity that's holding you back. Okay, so this, this, this is one definitely one cause of low productivity, right? You're just missing some core skills. A, a, another problem that sometimes people come, come across and tell me is I am stuck writing. And they just say, you know what, I'm stuck writing, and they start beating themselves up. I'm, I'm just not a good writer. I'm just never going to be a good writer. Maybe English isn't my first language, and I'm stuck. I don't know how to get unstuck, but this is really frustrating. Um, and this can definitely contribute to low P. And I'd say, I'd say, I actually, actually, the, the one of the most common symptoms I ever see um, from students is coming to say I'm stuck writing. And uh, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into that. I just want to get a roadmap up here of the different kinds of symptoms and the way that these express and the way that I've seen them in working with students right, at Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge over the, over the past 15 years as a professor. So the other uh, thing that can happen is um, that you simply, simply uh, don't have enough time. You feel like you just, you know what, it's great. I actually feel like I'm getting stuff done um, when I do have time. But, you know, I've got kids. I've got other stuff going on. Uh, I, you know, I have all these responsibilities. Maybe I'm doing a part-time TBC and I have another, another job. Just don't have I don't have the time, and and that's leading to my low productivity. Okay, another one is that is simply I'm I'm, I'm multitasking a lot. I, I really I, I and this is kind of linked to lack of time. That uh, I you know well I, you know I've got so many things to do, and uh, and I'm just bouncing from one thing to the other, and it's really hitting me because when I finally sit down, it's you know, I'm, I'm just just kind of distracted and a bit frazzled and, and I'm just not there. And that can happen with really, I, and, and they'll say to me, well, I just need to get better at multitasking. You know, I just, that, that's it. I'm just, I'm just not good at multitasking. Okay. Yeah. Um, I heard that a lot. And another is that, that I, they just, they'll tell me, well, I'm just getting distracted. I, I, I'm getting in front of the computer and I'm drawing a blank and I'm just blank, and I don't know if it means I'm stuck riding, or or I start riding, and then I, I just, I don't know, it's like my train gets derailed, and I'm there, but then and then suddenly I'm not there anymore, um, and and I, I just I just kind of feel like I just don't want to do it anymore. Um, so these, these are kind of, look, there's more, okay, but these are some of the most common ones, guys, and don't, don't be embarrassed. Um, have any of you experienced any of these, let, let us know in the comments because right, many people with low P, I think one of the problems is they're embarrassed. They don't want to say, oh, I, you know, guys say, hey, I, I, do you have low P? I, I have low P, guys. Yeah, the, it, because you don't want to get find out, found out. You already feel, potentially, if you have low P, a little bit like an imposter, like a fraud, and somebody's going to figure out, like, oh, you're, you're not good enough. You're not going to make the cut, and they're going to kick you out. And that's scary, right? Because then those inner demons you got to conquer come in, mastering your own mind, and you start to doubt yourself, and you lose your confidence. 
and it's like you've lost your whole groove and it, it starts kicking this negative spiral. You get in your head and then you're stuck riding and you're like, I can't get out of it. And you don't know how to break the cycle. Well, we're going to help you break the cycle because we got tried and tested techniques for each one of these symptoms of low P. You've got to think about what is going on. So uh, we got somebody in the Facebook group who says, I am stuck. Okay, I'm going to go with stay a stuck riding and don't know what to do. Okay, so and don't know what to do. So most people, I will say, they will often identify stuff on the technical side. And uh, I, I kind of tricked you a little bit by drawing this bright line because many cases, as I start to dig deeper, these technical side problems have some origins that actually are linked to other things uh, going on. Uh, going on. Not always, but, but, but often. Okay, so if you are stuck riding, if you're stuck riding, Often, there, there, there are a couple things going on. Often, right, if we trace back here, you feel stuck. Well, in the first place, it's that uh, you shouldn't be writing. You're not ready to write. If you're not ready to write and you're trying to write, you've got a problem. I have so many people who are not ready to write and they're trying to figure out what they want to say by writing. You sh writing is often the last 10 to 15 percent. I even say the last, probably 10 percent of the project. You only want to write when you've done the analysis and you know what you want to say. You know what your key points are going to be. You have a clear outline, a clear structure, a clear framework in place. And so people will tell me, oh, I'm going in circles in my writing. I'm just stuck. I'm getting nowhere. I'm editing, re-editing. Oftentimes, this traces back, you're just not ready to write. And so taking that step back, if you're doing quantitative work or qualitative work, it, we create a result set where you have your main points, your main big messages, your kind of highlight reel of what you found from your analysis, maybe in tables or figures or in qualitative work through a table with key quotes and themes that have emerged. When you've got that, you'll find, actually, I know what to say. And you begin to write things yourself. I often recommend two, another framework here. Um, I, I recommend writing from the inside out. So oftentimes people get really stuck and they're trying to write an introduction. But that's the last thing you want to do. It's the hardest thing to write. And it's going to change. It's going to change in light of what you ultimately find. Now, sometimes your program may want you to write an introduction already because they want to see that you're making some progress and you can get things done. That's okay. Don't get too hung up on that. But generally, what's the easiest thing to write? Let's take a step back and think, what's the easiest thing to write? The methods. Because you've already done it. It's almost like writing the recipe for a cake you just baked. You're just going to say, well, this is what I did. And so if you're stuck writing, right now imagine trying to write those methods if you hadn't done the methods. You could try, but you might have to go back and change it multiple times. It won't, won't even necessarily be true to what you ultimately did. Because as many of you know with research, things sometimes evolve in unpredictable ways as you go along. Um, so again, it's just to show you, you know, if you're stuck, often you're not ready to write. And if you do write, I recommend writing with something that's going to get you moving and feeling good. And write from the inside out. Start from the methods, then go to the results, then go to the conclusion, and circle back last to the introduction. Inside out really helps people who, who, who are stuck writing. And remember, you need to have a clear structure in place. You need to know, know what you want to say and have that clarity. And often, I, and when I'm working with students and they're stuck writing, I say, well, what do you want to say? What, what's your main point? And even trying to explain it to me, they go in circles. I'm like, well, no wonder you're going in circles with your writing. It's not that you can't write. You can write. So you just got to step back. Okay. So that's one problem. And again, if you're stuck writing, tell me if this is not you. That's okay. Because there are different reasons that you can also get stuck in writing. Another reason to get stuck writing is you genuinely don't know how to write. And that's okay. I do find this commonly because often it's just not taught. And this is, again, one of the purposes of this group because, unfortunately, the, this is one of the most practical skills that employers want that you have to use day in, day out. It's like bread and butter as an academic is you need to know how to write. And yet we don't teach it. I, I think it's a scandal that we don't teach academic writing. And guess what? It's simple. We, we've got the formula. 
it's our peer system. If you haven't seen our peer system training, you've got to check this out. When I say change your life, I mean, living testament to people in this group, to all, maybe jump in here as well, because your know, writing was good before, but it, it will change your life. It will change your writing. It will change your career prospects. Um, so a very simple system that will make writing smooth and easy. And if you haven't had writing training and you're trying to write, well, look, academic writing is not like writing you've done before. And so you're fighting, imagine if you're stuck writing, you could be fighting two battles at the same time. You don't know what to write. So you're trying to figure out while you write and you don't know how to write. Well, n naturally, that's like throwing, like saying, sending a baby into like a jujitsu match. It's like, you just wouldn't do that. Why, that that's a terrible idea. There's a little, you need the kind of basic training before somebody can even begin to spar. And in this case, enter this realm and wrestle with the ideas and contribute something new. So, um, yeah, this is a big deficit, I think, across the board in, in university training. And I would say, I, I often like to ask my uh, students, have you had any writing training? And uh, it's like one out of 10 students in the class maybe had some writing training, maybe in high school, not even in, uh, in university. It's, it's very low. So th this is quite common. Um, so, yeah, and, and people are saying here, peer is gold. R really, guys, it's just one of those ideas. I think good ideas kind of hit you between the eyes. And good art's like that, too. You, you, you see something, and it never leaves you. You may love it. You may hate it. But it sticks with you. And, and this will stick with you. Um, so, um, yeah, so these things already, if you're in this cycle, right, you, if you've been here, you know that you will be burning and burning a, a, a lot of time. Um, the other thing that when people are, are often stuck, and this applies to this scenario, don't know what to do, is to, to seek help, is to seek help. There is no shame in this. And in fact, one of the things that I think took me a long time to learn was to, and took me confidence with myself. And I had to fight a lot of my own demons. I remember when I was a, a student in class, um, there would be something I didn't understand. And the professors would say, any questions? And I'm like, oh, I don't get something. But, oh, I don't want to sound stupid in front of other people. And I would get anxious. I, like, I could feel my heart rate going up. Like, again, it was that imposter syndrome that I hadn't dealt with. I hadn't mastered my inner mind. I hadn't conquered those inner demons of as somebody in the chat is saying that being judged aspect. And I was scared and it held me back. And I was too scared to say, no, I don't understand. And it's, it's even now it's still hard to say, no, I, I don't, I don't understand. Can you explain it to me? Something so simple and yet we don't do it. Again, because we don't want to be found out or something wrong. So this is exactly when you need to seek the right kind of help. Nobody is going to do that for you. Nobody is going to complete this journey to get you to the finish line. And all of you are already here. You've already been judged by your programs as good enough to take part and get to where you are. But the, the catchphrase always sticks in my head. And I think help me to start seeking help is what got you here will not get you there. I repeat it. What got you here will not get you there. Hugely important. Hugely important. Think about it. Think about it. You're doing a completely new task. In our minds, we want to do what we know how to do. But that's precisely why you're going down this journey. To push yourself to new limits, to acquire new skills. So it's natural Right? If you are like babies in the field, I think one of the most humbling experiences for me was when I started as a PhD student was like looking up at these giants and gurus in the field and feeling very, very small. And right, as, as you've climbed the mountain to get to where you are, as you continue to climb that mountain, you are going to need to get new techniques, methods, skills, abilities. You have to seek help. You have to make that investment in yourself. And don't be afraid of that. That is what this time is for. I miss the time that you have when you can invest in yourself. Um, so I, I, I 
seriously, don't don't lose sight of that. So uh, somebody saying uh, so true. I'm not sure to w which which part, but um, really really um, important. So guys, let me know if if any of this kind of these feelings. We don't often talk about the emotional side of the equation, but and we often just talk about the technical, the writing, the ability, the ideas. But beneath all of that is this hidden layer of our state of well-being. Uh, in, in our emotions and our feelings and we don't always all there's this idea we've got to be cool rational scientists we just want to negate all that stuff it could be farther from the truth the people who who really thrive and go far are masters of of their state of their mind of their presence and the symptom again when something is going wrong is this low p and this is a great case study it's a great you have to flip this and think of this as if i have low p this is an opportunity there's an opportunity for me to take proactive steps now to improve and, and do something about it. Okay. Um, so I talked about using a data-driven approach. How can you do this? So I think many of you, if you are struggling with low P, flipping up here, will feel a lack of time. And often that lack of time, it could be, could very well be that there's a lack of time. Um, and the natural strategy is, if you have a lack of time, you need to find a way to win back your time. So how are you going to do that? What, what is the approach? Well, we need to approach it like a scientist, and we need to do something called making a time diary. Probably, I don't know if you've ever done this before, but all right, I've got a really good friend, probably one of my closest friends in high school. And uh, he, uh, you know, we, we used to play tennis together, and, you know, he, we, our paths kind of took a fork in the road. He got married, had a family, um, started working a job, and you know I, I continued kind of the, the lone traveler, single, single life as a student, and uh, you know somehow in there he developed the dad bod, and probably not just one dad bod, but the equivalent of three dad bods. He was morbidly obese, and you know caring about my friend, I, I'm like, hey, look, uh, I've got to lose some weight. And he's like, yeah, man, but it's hard. I don't have time. I can't go to the gym. Can't do other things. And like diet, uh, like ah, uh. like okay, okay. Well, look, let's just start. And let's get data on what's going on, and then we can diagnose. Is the problem? Is it you're, you're not exercising? Is the problem that right? You're just eating some of the wrong things. And so, what did we agree to do? Well, we're going to count calories using an app like My Fitness Pal or or something else, and. Uh, we rapidly realized, hey, man, you know, hey, he was getting more than 10,000 steps a day in his job, which is pretty good. Um, but just by tracking the calories, we figured out, hang on, wait a second. There were just a few meals and snacks and things that, a few tweaks and substitutions, we were able to knock out on a daily basis about 650 calories from his diet daily, and he didn't feel like he had even lost anything or he didn't even feel more hungry. Now, what gets measured gets done. And this approach of just counting calories has its own benefit in itself to make you aware of where the inefficiencies are. It's the same with the time diary. You need to log your activity, and there are lots of tools. You can There are apps you can download 100% free. You can do this with a good old-fashioned Excel sheet to track your time. Do this for one week. Do this for one week. Track everything you do. You've probably never done this, um, but it's worth it. And it'll change the way you look at your schedule. It's going to help you capture dead spaces in your time and reactivate them. And it's going to make sure you really blocked and allocated time that you need crucial time because these aren't just, you can't just slot in 15 minutes. I'm going to do research. You have to get a dedicated block and chunk of time. So once you know, I, I've got the help. I know what to do. I'm not trying to write when I'm not ready to write. Yeah, we need to budget the time and we need to budget efficiently. And this time diary is going to, help you with that. Now, there's no amount of wizardry is going to fix the situation if you only have one hour a week to do research. If you only have one hour a week to do research, even after this time diary and you just can't block it, just don't beat yourself up. There's not a whole heck of a lot you can do beyond that. There's one hour. I, right, I, I often say to publish a systematic review, for example, if you can invest five to 10 hours and you got the right support and training, um, you can get it published and done within three months. I had a doctor I was working with. She only could do one, two hours a week because she was working a lot on the COVID wards. It took her six months, right? There is on some level, time in and, and results out. 
then that basic equation you right you can't negate. So, um, but do take this time diary, and from that time diary, it's going to help you identify the two things I'm talking about: is dead spaces you can maybe activate. So you can be reading on a, maybe on a, a train on the way to work or listening to a podcast on the way to work. Um, there's other things you can do in, in your time diary as well. That, that can also help with literature reviews, uh, even just listening to papers as you go along. So try to find ways to activate those dead spaces. Um, and the other thing that you can try to do is really is focus on time blocks. And we've got a really good training on this called the architecture of your perfect day. A uh, whole training on that is freely available in the Facebook group. And it's going to help you identify which blocks you can best leverage uh, for, for your time. And uh, th by having the diary, it's going to help you identify where you can recapture those blocks of time. And it, that will make a difference to really optimize the time that you have. Second thing I want to talk about here is multitasking. Here, here we go. Here we've got a user, by the way, saying, um, I have my own days and time diaries are great for planning my day, focusing my tasks, maintaining food and my well-being. Yeah, you know, it gives you a sense of control. And that's important because oftentimes when you're doing a PhD, you can feel really, when people really start getting low P, they feel lost and out of control. And this is a way to kind of re kind of take, uh, do a big reset and put you back in the driver's seat to get you to start mastering your own mind. Um, so yeah, right. I mean, just in the same way, Olympic athletes are training for ultimate physicality to do amazing human physical feats, right? Effectively, you're doing the equivalent with your mind in academic knowledge production. You are like a, a mental Olympian. That is what you're training for. You are contributing to science and advancing your field. So naturally, yes, this, this, is, this is not easy. Um, so, okay. Um, then uh, just a couple things. We're going to come to, uh, several people are pointing out, Lack of time and distracted, wandering mind too. Um, I think I think we're gonna go there. Somebody uh, definitely liked uh, like like the quote here. Thanks, guys. I, I, that, that's uh, I find myself saying that a, a lot to people um, when when they're feeling lost. We have others saying, "Hey, lack of time." This is really true. By the way, we've got another training with uh, Professor Courtney McNamara in the group about how she's publishing six papers a year with three kids. She doesn't have five. Uh, like like the mother here in full time employment, but she's got heavy teaching load, uh, three young kids, which you can imagine is a lot, and a husband who also travels a lot for work. So watch that session. She is in a much better place to talk about some of the really fantastic tips and techniques uh, with children to balance this out. Um, and others are saying distraction, multitasking, holding me back. I have, I have great ideas, but can't focus. Need urgent help. You you can sense. Guys, when you're suffering this low P, just how easy it is to slip into beating yourself up for this. That you think something is wrong with you. Something is not wrong with you. Something is not wrong with you. Um, okay, bar from if you have major mental major mental program problems, okay. But 90% of the time, there isn't something major wrong with you because you already got here. You were able to get to this point. You, you are qualified. You are capable. So we're going to dig into deeper to some of the, some of the causes under, underlying the issues here. Other thing, multitasking. Um, my my solution is don't. Just no. Big red X. Don't. We are not made to be good at multitasking. That's not us. We are very good at doing one thing. And so if you're trying to do ten things at once, well, how are you going to have the time, energy to to break new ground, to push yourself to that new mental frontier? You're not. You're just not. So when people say, I'm just going to get better at multitasking, it never happens. I'm not good at, I'm terrible at multitasking. Terrible. The best I can do is I've got a tedious task. I can maybe put on some music, uh, maybe, which I do only in the most tedious and tedious of tasks. Um, but don't get into this trap. In fact, you need to do the opposite of multitasking. Um, you need to try to optimize one thing. A strategy I call the optimization of one. You need to find the most important thing you need to get done to get to that next level and focus on that. And have almost a maniacal focus on that one thing. And in and, and some ways to do that, sometimes, again, because remember, your mind is going to want to tell you, nope, not going to do that. Don't want to do that. Nope, nope, don't want to do it. And any excuse, oh, I need to go check the laundry. 
Uh, maybe I need to pack my kids lunch. Um, anything, anything, any reason to escape. And this is a strategy in this optimizing one. Once you know what your one is, called kill the frog. And kill the frog is this idea that right, you need to go like the most unpleasant thing. That's the most important thing, right? Whatever that is, that most important thing, even if it's unpleasant, needs to be the first thing in your day. The first thing in your time block that you allocate. Um, so you need to define your one and basically kill it. That, that's what you need to do and get out of this multitasking cycle that can trap you in a cycle of low P, not doing any of the tasks. Well, well at all. Um, okay. Let me keep going. Distraction. Um, right. Th there's an easy fix and a hard fix here, depending on what it's coming from. Sometimes distraction is coming from you are in an environment where, hey, your kid walks in the door and starts sucking at your leg, I'm hungry, or the phone starts ringing, or you got Facebook or socials. Again, remember, your mind is looking for these excuses to get away from the task at hand. We have mental muscles, and often in this day and age, they get flabby because everything is pushing us, everything is pushing us to short time cycles. I go on Instagram, I see a reel. All right, I, I, I produce content on YouTube. I make it short and I have to squeeze everything into a minute because that's what people's attention span is. PhD is like you're a salmon swimming up the current against the current because everything is pushing us to limited time cycles. Hit, hit, bam, 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 bam. And instead, what you have to do is stay focused for an extended period. I see it with my students all the time. I give a lecture for an hour and a half. I, I mean, I, I routinely go to the university and this is like students can't concentrate for an hour and a half anymore. They're not there. These lectures don't work. Um, so, um, yeah, the, you're, you're distracted because that type of deep, intense concentration, you never do it. It's like if you're going to go tell me to say, okay, hey, go bench press you know, 150 kilos, like, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I, I got to build up slowly to that. So, right, think of it as like mental training, like you're a, an, a mental athlete for the mental Olympics or something. And it takes training to become indistractable. The way you can do that and help yourself is to construct an environment that makes it easier to be indistractable, right? So you know, put yourself in a blank room, turn the phone off, shut off your socials, don't let yourself, right? There's, there's a cliche that's really true that um, pre-commitment is more powerful than willpower. It's like, look, if I go back to my buddy who's having trouble with food, some of the things we found were snacks and certain chocolate bars that were contributing to the 650 calorie excess that we were able to knock out. Um, right? We had two strategies. One said, hey, don't eat that. Just don't eat it. But the other pre-commitment strategy was take those chocolate bars and hide them up on a very high shelf that he couldn't get to very easily and eventually just forgot about. So of these two, right? even if, even if you have the best willpower, pre-commitment is more powerful. And lots of psychological studies have shown in face of temptation, pre-commitment is better, right? Um, you don't wanna cheat on your partner, all right? Don't, don't go to some place like a strip club or some place where you're gonna get exposed to lots of temptation if you're, you're worried about it, right? Um, I, I think we can see pre-committing, just don't put yourself, don't expose yourself to it in the first place is gonna work better. You can do that. So if you identify the things that are distracting you, again, approach this like a scientist, what's distracting you? And you're going to see that? How are you going to get the data for that? Your time diary. So you can definitely, you can do it. You can, you can do this. Identify those distractions and eliminate them. Speaking of eliminating, just remember one other model in the time diary that can win you back time. I said dead spaces or one other model. I didn't want to get into it because it's more complicated and something I do on a more one-to-one -ba -one basis, but something called XDA. You can look at your time and figure out what can you cut, what can you delegate, and what can you automate. This may not be an option for all of you, and this may not just apply to your academic work, but it's a very powerful tool to winning back time. But you need the data first to do it, just like you need the data here to figure out which way you're gonna go. Now, I said with distraction, there's something else going on. And I, often with distraction, there can be a deeper issue going on of you've hit a burnout and you may be losing passion. You often hear people talking about this. I loved my topic, but now I don't, I don't even wanna look at it anymore. I'm so tired of it. This is tough. This can be really tough. Because once you've gotten to this point, you, yeah, you're getting burnt out. And it often sets yourself up for a crash. And this is very hard to deal with di directly. Why? Because this starts to have elements of depression into it. 
like to talk about what's the symptom of depression you don't have the joy in the things you used to enjoy and losing that that drive that passion is a deeper problem and it's often one of the last things that start ha- starts to happen when you've been going in circles for a long time you felt stuck you didn't know what to do and then you start associating this negativity with your topic and that that mental association of my topic is connected with anxiety i mean that's the whole point of association that is the crux of marketing that's why coca-cola doesn't even necessarily show coca-cola bottles anymore and people say mm, so tasty it's like they show advertisements just here over Christmas of Santa Claus. And like, what does that do? They're associating positive feelings with Coca-Cola. But that marketing has gone haywire in your brain because you suffered for so long that now you associate your topic with something horrible. It's like, right, if you touch, you know, as a kid, we learned, we touch the hot stove and it's hot, that freaking hurts, not going to do that. And you kind of have conditioned yourself, don't touch the hot stove. Well, you have conditioned yourself to say, I hate my topic. And one of the things I find very powerful is a big turnaround in students I've worked with where, you know, they were on the cusp of dropping out and they were suffering from low P and we worked then on these other areas. we got things in place. we got the time and suddenly, slowly but surely, it's like, hey, this is fun. And that's, that's the feeling you want. That is the feeling you want. When it starts to feel like, hey, this is fun, you know you are doing it right. When it doesn't feel like a job, you know you're doing it right. And many of you have that originally before going down this path. You want to make an impact in the world. You want to make a difference. That's why we haven't sold out for corporate dollars and gone into the pharmaceutical sector or banking sector, cashed in on our intellect in other ways. So I want you to win that passion back. But unfortunately, often this is the symptom and you can't address this one directly. It's most likely going to have come from other things. And that's why when so many people come to me say, hey, I don't have any passion, I'm burnt out, and I got a deadline in a month. <sighs> the reality is it's too late. It's too late. And that's why I'm so glad that you're all here because I, I don't want that to happen to you. Okay. Um, so uh, there, there's lots of things going on here. The other thing, how to uh, master mind with social media distractions, that's it. Turn it off. There are apps on there, your phone. Shut it off. Delete it. If you have to, uh, delete it if you have to. Seriously, you, you'd be surprised. Delete it and see if your life goes on. At least for this time, it will. The easiest way, get rid of it, right? Again, like I was saying, pre-commitment versus world power, willpower. If you have to, throw away the chocolate bar. Make it inaccessible. Make it harder to be distracted. Um, and somebody else commenting here, I think mastering the mind is a gradual process that involves cultivating oneself at every moment. This is a never ending struggle, never ending. Every day you wake up and you want to make sure you don't have low P. You want to get the most out of your day. That is, that is living your life to the fullest. That is you controlling your day, your destiny, not being in a constant reactive mode. Now, speaking of the con- this constant re- reactive mode. There are certain things, there are certain things that are just general tips that have done wonders for me. And even though I struggle to stick with them all the way, they have done wonders for me. So one is, um, especially in this time, right? If you think about military discipline, everybody is on a clock. They are on a schedule because, right, the military basically owns you. You are like their slave and they want to get the most out of you. They're going to squeeze productivity out out of you. They can't let you be low P. And they have a routine. Once you have identified your time diary, I think many of you will find your day and your schedule is chaotic, is not regular. And for you to get those right associations of getting in the zone, being in a workplace, you want to show up consistently, regularly, as best you can, um, within the constraints of your schedule and the kids and the job and other things you might have going on. But you do need to try to create a routine, and this is going to help you get good associations when you get into that space of, hey, now it's time to work. And it's going to get easier to get in that flow. It's good. It's going to, again, we're setting up our work architecture to make productivity easier. So that routine is going to help. The other thing that's going to really help is your sleep hygiene. And anxiety doesn't help if you're facing that. But some things on sleep hygiene that really help, I found, are the 3 2 1 rule. Don't know if you're aware of this, but it's stop eating three hours before bed, stop drinking two hours before bed, and one hour before bed, get off social media. 
the no social rule. Get off the phone, blue light, all that. I won't go into that, but you will find that this really helps. That no social rule, one hour before bed and one hour on waking up. And the reason is, right, If you, especially some people I know, they're writing messages or looking at things that are work-related right before bed. You are not getting the deep rest that you need as a mental athlete to recover for the next day. And just if you do this when waking up, you can throw yourself into a permanent kind of reactive mode. It's not like you're grabbing the day, like the bull by the horns are grabbing the day and you're setting it. You're waking up and you're getting a message like, oh, I got to respond to that. Adrenaline is going, oh, I got to respond to that. Somebody else is controlling your day. So um, simple, right? Simple things that you can practice. I, I, I will say, I think a lot of you might find yourself glued to your phone a lot throughout your day and especially at night. Give this a try. Just, just again, I, I, if you guys have struggled with low P at all, you owe it to yourself to try some of this for a week. And report back. Let me know how you're getting on. But just by, by taking the time diary, maybe practicing some of these rules, probing deeper into which one of these, if any of these, is me, and, 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 and try to do, I mean, it's not simple, but try to, do, try to do better every day, just a little bit better, just a little bit. And over time, those small gains, it's the power of compounding. They accumulate and accumulate. And grow, and grow, and grow, and grow, and grow, and grow. And then they snowball, and they exponentially go up. It's a magic of compounding, which Einstein called the seventh wonder of the world. Um, and these, these small, the accumulation of these small gains in your productivity get to where you will be amazed. It's almost like having a superpower when you can control your productivity at will. But it doesn't come overnight. It takes time. Okay, guys. Um, inevitably... I've only scratched the surface here on a topic I don't think that we talk enough about. Let me know if you found this helpful. Again, give us a like if you found this useful. And uh, let me know here if you have any other questions. I'm going to scroll back through some of the questions where people said, yep, wandering mind. And I hope you found some of the tips that you, you can at least start to deploy now to help with that. Um, again, things we don't talk about, but we should. Here's another one. I feel half written papers, but don't have the energy to finish. I think this kind of burnout cycle can be applying to you. And sometimes, sometimes you do have to disconnect and give yourself a little bit of a break, especially if you've gone too far down the burnout cycle. You're, once you're on that path, you almost have to complete the cycle and uh, give yourself a little bit of space, which is sometimes hard to do. And sometimes it can be very renewing. Um, you'll sometimes notice that you find your best ideas when you're on a walk or you're in a shower. And that, that can really help to push through those last bits uh, of, of the PhD. Um, again, there's no magic solution because as you can see, the problem in and of itself is often multifaceted. There are often multiple things going on. So Selnaz, I would say to you, check and see if some of these other areas are, are, are at play here. And if you can make some progress on those because they will start alleviating that underlying pressure that's kind of triggering and fueling that these feelings of burnout and lack of passion. Um, and, and sometimes, unfortunately, there is no alternative than to complete that burnout cycle and take a very deep break. Unfor unfortunately, if you've gotten that far down the chain, it, it's, it can be that it's gone too far. But again, do, don't give up hope because many people who've had burnouts do come back from them successfully and do, do attack these other areas. Um, okay. Now, I said I was going to take through some of our submissions this week, and we did lose a little bit of time on this. Uh, well, I say lose a little bit of time. I think this is the most, most important thing uh, that, that you can do for yourself. So the three and two. Three and two is really about, uh, if somebody's asking here about the three, two, one rule. Three is stop eating three hours before bed. Rule two is stop drinking two hours before bed. This is not all right, a weight-related thing thing at all. It is just simply what studies have found can help promote better sleep. And the one hour rule is get off socials one hour before bed. I'm not always good at this myself. I have to admit, I'm, I'm really bad about number two because I'm constitutionally thirsty. I mean, I've got a, a big water here, so I'm often wanting to drink right before bed. But right, even something simple like getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, if that ever happens to you, you're breaking your sleep cycle 
And how can you avoid breaking your sleep cycle, getting less efficiency from your sleep? Well, just shut off the faucet uh, before bed. So again, right, there's no one size fits all solution here. When somebody says something like, I have low P, everybody's different, but there are some commonalities in, in these things going on and some commonalities and that we can tap the big reserve of human experience of, of what can help. Um, thank you for asking for that clarification though, because you know, if I, if, if you're not understanding it, then it's like uh, asking for help and somebody else is not going to understand it. You are actually helping our entire community by bringing this up. Okay. Uh, let me pivot. Um, and okay, keep asking me questions. I'll circle back. I'm going to go ahead and open up um, a screen with your, your questions for this week. Every now and then we do these mini tradings. Um, and this week, I just, I think it's the start of the new year. And a lot of people were expressing to me that they, they were struggling with their productivity. Um, so uh, don't, don't suffer or struggle in silence. Okay. I've got Sarah. Sarah writes to me, hey, everyone. I've got a research project. Let me see if I can pop this in the chat. And Sarah says, she's in the Facebook group. Hey, I've got a research project in pharmacognosy. I'm, I'm not sure that's spelled right. And says, there's some points I don't understand. Anybody would like to collaborate to research with me would make me glad. You know, one of the things that's really powerful, I really, really believe in this, is community. And we've had so many students start working together, collaborating in our Facebook group. And all you've got to do is say, hey, I'm working in this space. Anybody want to partner up? Let's team up. Let's work together to both get on the, the fast track uh, together. All you got to do, again, is go to our Facebook group and pop in a message. Let people know what you're looking for. Right? Join the group. I'll approve your post. Just don't, don't spam us. And uh, you'll be amazed. Um, people like to collaborate. It can be really inspiring. And you know what? This actually links to another technique. I always like to say Watson had a crick, um, the two who discovered DNA. And when I wrote my second book, I had a co-author, uh, Sanjay Basu, and it really kept us motivated. It really kept us motivated to have balanced ideas and chat with each other. And community can do that. Sometimes you can rediscover the passion of your idea just by seeing somebody else get excited about your idea. And you remember what it's all about. So don't discount the, the importance here of, uh, of community and keeping you motivated and, and productive. I mean, there's so many more productivity tips and tricks I, I can get into, but that, that's one for you, Sarah. And uh, yeah, I'll be looking forward to seeing your post. Okay, Saba sent a research proposal. So we're gonna take a look at the research proposal and we're gonna look at that with our gift method. Um, so let me come back to the chat and I'll send to you what, uh, what, what she said. Currently, I'm writing a research proposal, but still unable to identify some good research gaps. Write many papers, though. So we sent Saba our, our gap training. I don't know to what extent she's done it, but she did send her proposal that we're going to take a quick look at here. So I'm just going to pull it up. And it's kind of like a mini training on our gift method. So what you need to do fundamentally before writing up your proposal is you need to have clarity on what the gap in knowledge is that you want to address. And you need clarity about how your idea is going to going to address it. So let me see if I can uh, zoom this screen in because this is going to be a little bit hard to see, I think. And if you, you, you struggle to see the screen, let me know. But I'm just going to highlight. We're going to do this very quickly. Um, okay. So examining health literacy and emotional influence on VR technology adoption, a cognition effect, cognition perspective. Okay. I like that you've got a framework that you're going to look at, that you're going to use to unpack and understand different dimensions of the question. But immediately, this is very, is quite vague. Um, it's quite vague. But let's see if you've unpacked this a little bit more. So the purpose of this research is to investigate the complex interaction between emotional reactions, health literacy, and the uptake of VR health technologies. So remember what I said, the difficulty of saying, I don't understand. I don't really understand. So is the idea to say that if somebody knows more about health, uh, a consumer, they're going to be more likely to use a health technology. I would make this a lot clearer. What is the big issue? Why are we having this conversation now? What's what's the big debate here? And again, what's what's the gap? What um, what's the issue? Let's see here. This research will specifically look at how health literacy influences worry and how satisfied users are with VR health technology. I think it would also be clear to say well, what VR health technology. This is rapidly emerging. 
Uh, I mean, as a consumer, I've never used VR health technology. I'm not even sure I know that much about it. And this might be a problem also, maybe you're in a specialized area where supervisors will, but um, you need to explain this. Maybe there's a, a health technology that's really important, has pr tremendous potential to bring about health gain, but nobody's using it. Well, that I think you wanna bring that up front and make it very concrete and paint a picture of what you're trying to do. Um, so I, I find this a little bit vague. Let me see if I can find the gap. I can already see from the writing that you might want our peer system, including each paragraph making one point. Um, so you're saying you think people who understand health information is essential to make the most of this technology. Okay. What's the gap? So you haven't said what the gap is. So... Your hypothesis, again, we, we don't have a research question here. It's, it's Again, it's very, very exploratory, and I think you're going to be doing, you're setting this up to do quantitative work. If you're going to set up quantitative work, you want clear hypotheses. I don't see, I don't see the gap. So you're saying to bridge the identified gap, but I don't see the gap. So I think you're wanting to say people might feel anxious about using this technology, but somehow that's related to if they're more health literate, and that will shape them adopting it. So I think you need to try to get generally, thanks for sharing this with us. I think you're on the track, right track. You've got the right elements there, but you need to get much more concrete. See if you can set up a clear direction of your research question and even map out a causal chain which you wish to study. Um, it looks like your outcome is technology adoption, but you need to go a little bit more in detail about which of these are very commonly accessible and available to consumers and why they are so, so, so important. Um, so, um, yeah, this is, again, there's a lot of good things I like. I also want you to look at our peer writing training because that's going to help you make the case more clearly to get structurally to say, here's the gap, here's what we don't know, and then roll in, here's my research question, plug that gap. And we want those two to be directly in contact, but as they're currently written, they're, they're just not fully clear. Somebody says, uh, just back here, so you didn't comment on my question. Um, shoot, sorry, I, I'm not sure which which question you're, you're referring to. So um, let me know again here in the comments, and I'll come right back to that. Okay, continuing through, we have Safiano who says, how can I access the advanced search builder for Scopus and Web of Science? Um, and Tal had a, an idea on that, the earlier question uh, about diffusion of innovation theory. Um, yeah, and that, again, that, that's one of the great things too. I, I can cover a lot of areas, but we've got a lot of subject area experts in the group too who can give you really helpful feedback. Okay, how can I access the advanced search builder? Okay, well, to go into Web of Science, let, let me show you how to do it. Usually you need to go through your library's portal because you need to get access to the subscription. So you right, if you just many people will go to Web of Science and create a login Web of Science, and that is not going to get you, it's gonna get you access through your account, but not your institution's account. So you need to go through and do this through your institution. And let me just show you very briefly what this looks like, um, just to de demystify this whole process. I'm just going to um, uh, in the background while I'm doing this, I'm just logging into the account and uh, let me share a source here, if I can find it, two seconds, okay. I'm gonna share a window and let's go, is it this one? Yeah, here, Web of Science, I've got Web of Science here. And it's gonna be the same for the others. And what you're gonna see here, and when you get into Web of Science, now that you're logged in, just advanced search. Just go to advanced search. Let me activate this, see? So, okay, we've got Web of Science up. Once you've gotten in through, through your access, you will have this advanced search option. And that's it. Almost all the all the databases that are subscription access work in the same way. So I'm glad you asked that um, because it's kind of one frustrating thing. You can't even get started because you can't find where the database is. Um, so somebody says, please note that I send you my draft proposal for your support. Not sure. Uh, sorry, because um, unless you give f uh, Facebook permission, I can't see who who the name is. But I'm going to keep, uh, I think I might come to your question later on. Um, so, um, got another question. 
that I'm going to uh, cover here. Um, what are the tips for writing the discussion section? Um, should evidence peer be coming from eligible articles or not? I'm not sure what you mean. The oh, oh, right, the discussion section. So the discussion section really has a kind of standard format. You want to recap what you found very briefly and say what the limitations of your research were, and then go into talking about maybe the strengths of your study, how it's consistent or not with existing work, making proposals for uh, future research, and then any discussions for practice or policy if those are relevant. Um, so when you say should the evidence part of peer, here's our writing framework, um, the evidence, yeah, I mean, your discussion section is based on kind of now interpreting and going deeper in what, what, what you found means. So your results you've kind of presented, I, hey, I did this method and I found this. Your, your discussion section, you inject more yourself and you really begin to interpret what that means for, for the field and for future work. Um, so I hope that helps. We've got a dedicated uh, example and, and an outline in our guide 11 training in our Facebook group on, on this very topic. So I'll put that in chat. Head over to guide 11 and uh, you'll find it there. Okay, somebody, I, I, okay, I think what you're saying is somebody has asked a question. I think methodology on how to collect certain information sometimes is difficult. I'm not sure I fully understand what the question is, um, but definitely, right? It, it's difficult. You need a PhD to do it. There's a reason. So yeah, just embrace that, that difficulty. And if it's too difficult, seek help. I often find, try to throw my students off the deep end because I want them to figure things out for themselves as best they can. And then I'm not gonna let them drown. I'm gonna pull them out and help them to keep swimming. So yeah, it's difficult. So I'm gonna come back on the research proposal. Um, does this research proposal seek to explore people's health literacy using technology such as health apps? Yeah, that might be a nice clarification. That that seems already uh, more clear to me than what was there before. Uh, and somebody's here asking the same question. What are the tips for writing the conclusion? Yep, head to guide eleven, and the, the discussion and conclusion um, are often following the same the same framework. So head, check out guide eleven. It's really going to help you. Okay, we've got uh, a book. Abu eh, sorry, mispronouncing your name. Abubakar saying, my asking if he can do a systematic review on the topic. Oops, whoops. Uh, topic here of drug abuse and political thuggery. So, drug abuse is and substance use more generally is a common term. Political thuggery, I think maybe you mean corruption. Um, I would really recommend you. You could definitely do a systematic review on this, although I don't understand do you think that may i don't really understand really the substance use i get but do you think politicians are using drugs and then being more corrupt or i'm, I'm not sure i understand right so in a systematic review like with any research and the article the proposal we looked at before we need a look the research is hard enough like we just had somebody saying the methodologies are, methodologies are difficult make it simple Ask a simple question, right? So uh, let's share with one student I've been working with just today. Um, his question is very simple. Can artificial intelligence play the role of a second medical opinion, right? When you go to a doctor and you, uh, you know, right, maybe you're unsure, you go get a second medical opinion. He, he's asking a, a, a deep question. Can AI be that medical opinion? instead of a doctor. So try to frame things. You're going to have a much easier time if you shift from doing research that's exploratory to research that asks a clear question. In general, ask a question when you can. You're just going to save yourself so much headache um, by, by having a very clear, well-defined topic. Okay. Um, oh, and I, I love comments like these. Um, Here's one who's in the Facebook group, uh, JJ Chung. And actually, yeah, we've chatted a little bit, but this is just awesome to see. I don't, it doesn't, annoyingly, this platform doesn't let me uh, put everything in. But I love getting comments like these. The peer system, simple English approach, enlightened me in my academic writing. Um, and I'll, I'll read some of the rest here. Um, and let me see if I can get the rest of this in here, uh, share with you. Because it's just, 
right? When, when you guys are doing well and benefiting from your training, it makes me happy, right? We, we kind of work very effectively as not for profit and because we just want to create really good content to help you guys. And it's just great to see somebody who's been struggling and stuck feel like, ah, I've got the tool that's just, it was the key that, that opened up this lock that had kept the door closed in front of me. So thank you guys. I hear this so much by Peer and she just keeps going on, um, right? Um, just saying that that she, she's really getting a lot of you out of it. Thank you. Um, really, really appreciate that. Okay, guys, I think this is a good, po oh, right, one last one. Sorry, Kioma, if I, if I missed you, I'm really sorry uh, because I get a lot of these every week. So don't feel bad about chasing me. I tried to cover everybody. Last one, that's a good one. Does anyone know where I can publish my dissertation writing without paying a publication fee? So you wanna check journals. And when you go to the journal website, it will tell you what the different submissions are. So you'll see submit a manuscript and maybe we can take a concrete example and see if I can find it. And I often curse myself by saying that because then I, I try and I'm not able to find it. But let, let's see if we can. So let's take a journal, um, one we were thinking about, Journal of Medical Ethics, for example, is one we're thinking of submitting to. Is this showing my screen? Yeah. Journal of Medical Ethics. Submit your manuscript right here. Instructions for authors and copyright. Here we go. Copyright, article transfer, waivers and discounts. Here we go. A waiver may be available. So for this journal, right, um, are you based in low-income countries? You're eligible for a full or partial waiver. I hope you can see this. See, can you see this? Maybe not. I'll, I'll make the font bigger, right? And this may, and we've got a lot of you in the community who are uh, based in low-income countries, and that's fantastic. Take advantage of that. That's awesome. Um, and there's still this, regardless of the funding situation, authors can still choose to publish with us at no cost, right? This is just making the open access available. And uh, then there are often options here that you can choose at no cost. So you just need to go. Every journal, when you get to submit the manuscript page, is going to have these details. And check, because it may be your institution subscribes to different consortia, like here, um, these different, the different groups that have open access agreements. So this is saying you need to check with your institution, has this deal with this journal, which is part of the British Medical Journal publishing family. Um, you may have these waivers and so forth. So, you know, if you don't do that, um, you're going to miss out on journals where you don't have to pay a fee. And I'm of the mindset that um, you don't have to let this fee uh, prevent you from publishing in high impact journals. In fact, if you are in a low income country, you have a series of advantages you may not have even been aware of. If you have any more questions about that, get in touch with me directly. I'm really passionate about helping uh, students in low-income countries uh, publish and access these journals because that really it makes a big impact. I mean, I have people who told me they're the only person uh, from their community and, and even even some of them in their, in their department at their university that were able, thanks to this training, to publish in some of the highest impact international journals in the world. Um, and yeah, guys, this is part of why I get out of bed in the morning. Um, so... Listen, I hope you benefited from this training on low P. If you've seen any of these signs or symptoms or you just want to improve, uh, this is a quest that does not continue, it does not end in one day, but will carry through the rest of your research and, and your entire career. Um, and guys, thanks. Uh, I really love hearing that, that this is helping you. I uh, look forward to being in touch with all of you in the DMs. And uh, we're coming up on Friday, so... Hope you all have a wonderful rest of the week and weekend. I'll see you at the next session.